A while back, I built these benches, and they actually are really stable, and they've got this cool swooping spoiler in the back, and the legs are these pretty cool metal pieces, but they're not quite one piece, so they're really springy, which is what you want in a sitting device. And as fun as it is for three people to sit on this and eat dinner and have to rock back and forth at the same time, I think I'm gonna rebuild these. This time around, I'm gonna use more traditional building techniques. Now the top is gonna to be done the same way. It's just three two by sixes glued together. But as far as the base goes, I'm using two by two legs and I'm attaching one by two aprons all the way around with a couple of supports in the middle. To join all this together, we're gonna to use dowels. And so that means I get to use one of my favorite jigs, the doweling jig. Now, if you buy a quality one like this, these can get pretty expensive, but just think of this as an investment into something that you can use for the rest of your woodworking life to join wood together in almost any situation. If you don't want to buy a doweling jig, you can make your own. This crazy thing is one I made specifically for a project in my woodworking academy. I'm not going to show you how in this video, but just know that's an option. By the way, I've got a free plan for this project. The link for that is down below. I'm going to start by cutting the legs to length. They're all 16 inches, and I'm going to use the built-in stop function on my miter saw to make sure they're all exactly the same size. I want to put a nice taper on these legs. The taper is just starting at some point here at the top of the leg and making a cut that gradually reduces the thickness until we're at about half thickness by the time we get to the bottom. And I want to do this for both inside faces. So if the leg sits like this with an apron and an apron, these are the two inside faces. So we'll taper this one and we'll taper that one. The best way to make these cuts is with a jig like this. I built this in my last video and then I show you actually how to make the taper cuts. So I'll put a link to that down below so you can go watch it after you finish this video. Determining where to start your taper can really be up to taste and it depends on a few things. Do you have really wide aprons? Do you have a really wide drawer that's in the piece? Do you have narrow aprons like on this bench? I generally go with a quarter of the full length of the leg. So this one's 16 inches and when I was modeling this in SketchUp, I started the taper at four inches. That looked okay. But then when I backed it off to three inches, I liked that a lot better. So I went with three inches and then we'll end up at half the thickness of this leg down at the bottom, which is three quarters of an inch. Once I get these all set up, I can just batch through all four legs with the same fence position. Now we gotta cut our aprons and our supports to size. We've got front and back aprons, which are 50 inches a piece. The two ends are nine and three quarters, and then our supports are 10 and a half inches. I'm also gonna use the stop block where I can with these so that the matching pairs are exactly the same size. What I'm gonna do is measure on the first piece where each of those holes go. And then I'll set this wheel gauge to the middle of the top hole and then mark that one on every single piece. And then I'll set it to the bottom hole and mark that on every single piece. Another way that you could do this is to set your combination square to the right length and then mark that on each piece. I just need to come down three eighths from the top. That'll be the middle of our first dowel and then three quarters and that will be the middle of our second dowel. I'll mark about halfway across if I register this edge to mark the one on this end. When I flip it around, I need to register that same edge. I'm also gonna mark that edge that we referenced and that will be the top edge. So I know that the top of the apron goes with the top of the leg and that those holes were marked in the same way. Now we're going back to our original leg and we'll set up for the bottom hole. Again, referencing from that same top edge. 
If you want to pick one of these up, it's called a wheel marking gauge. They're really affordable and they're also extremely useful, just like you saw here for making consistent, repeatable marks. The last thing we got to do before we put this thing on and start drilling is to set the depth. I'm going to use a piece of blue tape on the drill bit to show me when I've gone deep enough. And we're going to set this to 13 sixteenths. I've made my mark and we need to measure this with the jig since this is going to be drilling through the jig. So we'll set this overhanging the end there. So every hole gets this depth except for the ones in the middle of the front and back aprons, which we'll deal with a little later. Now that we have the marks where our holes need to go, got our 5 16 hole right here on the jig and we're going to line up that mark on the side with the marks down there on our leg. So we'll slide this over until it's lined up on that mark and then we tighten this down, make sure it's still lined up. Now it's secure and stable for us to drill our 5 16 hole. So you may be yelling at your screen right now going, why did you go so close to the top? It's too close to the top. Why did you do that? My answer would be, I screwed up. I did measure 3 8 from the top of this and 3 8 is the right measurement. I just did it with the old trusty tape measure and I shouldn't know better than this, but I latched that end and it's severely bent and I didn't know it. So it's actually closer to a quarter of an inch so if you do three eighths of an inch and then three quarters from that, those are the right measurements. I just didn't want you to see that and think that you needed to add a little bit there. And along those lines, if you do measure with a tape measure, don't latch it on like this. Skip up to one inch or two inches and measure from there. That'll give you a lot better accuracy. Just remember that you started at one or two inches and subtract that from your final measurement. On these front and back aprons, we're not only going to mark the ends with the wheel gauge, we're also going to mark for the supports in the middle. Now each set of dowels that go in the middle of these aprons are 12 and a half inches from the ends. And we're using the same wheel gauge setting as we did with everything else. These holes we need to drill for the supports are a little bit different than the other holes since they're perpendicular to the edge and this jig's not really going to help us for those. I've got a good mark here on each of them. We've got a crosshairs and right in the middle I'm going to take an awl and start the hole. So now that gives me somewhere to start the bit. These also aren't going to be as deep as the other holes since we're not as thick here. They're only going to be 3 eighths of an inch deep and then the supports need to be an inch and an eighth deep since most of the dowel is going to go into the support. I'll measure that and mark it with blue tape on the drill and then we'll drill those by hand. Time to glue the dowels in and I've got the legs sitting here all the same way because I'm only going to glue in two dowels at a time so I can let them dry and then drill out this hole again since these dowels overlap. Now it'll still be fine. We're just drilling out the very bottom of this dowel. There'll still be plenty left in there, but we need to do that to allow for putting that dowel in. So we'll glue dowels into the supports and the legs and then we'll be ready to assemble the whole base. Before I go crazy and start gluing all this together, I need to do a dry fit and make sure it actually fits. And then if I run into a situation where the dowels aren't quite lined up or they are a tight fit or it's not quite square, I can take the drill bit and ream it out a little bit and make it so it fits better.
Well, it's mostly good news. Everything lines up great. Glue up's not gonna be a problem at all, but I do have to trim some of these dowels. I didn't drill the hole deep enough on one side or another. But you will run into that where you have to tweak and finesse a little bit to get it to come together sometimes. So don't feel bad if you didn't do it perfect and you need to finesse it to get it to come together right. I have to do that all the time. So let me get this torn down and I'll sand all the pieces, trim the dowels that need to be trimmed, and then put it all back together and glue it up. I'm also gonna number each matching piece so that when I put this all back together, I put it together the same way. I'm painting my base, so the highest I went was 120 grit because I want the paint to really soak into the wood. If you're just gonna put a clear coat on the wood, or even if you're gonna stain, you might go to 220, but you don't need to go beyond 220. When I sand it, I made sure to roll over the edges and make them nice to the touch. On the bottom of the legs, I beveled each edge, and that's so when it's dragging on the floor, it doesn't tear the fibers out. The clamps that I love for a glue up like this are these pipe clamps. Not only can you get a really long clamp for an affordable price, but they've got a lot of weight to them that keeps the base level as it dries. And that's the most important part that all four legs are sitting on the ground as it dries and it doesn't rock back and forth. While this dries for a few hours, I'm gonna get started on the top. For my top, I'm gonna to use these construction grade two by sixes and I need to cut them down to length so I'll just find the best portion of each one of these and then I'm gonna mill them up. I'm gonna take them to the joiner and the thickness planer and the table saw. Once I get them all nice and flat and square, then I'm gonna actually drill for dowels in the edge of each one of these and that will help us with alignment when we go to glue these up. Now that I've got this all clamped up, I'm gonna wait about 30 or 45 minutes and come back and scrape all this glue once it dries just a little bit. It's really easy to do it that way. So when you're clamping this up, ideally you'll have glue squeeze out all the way down each seam. That tells you that number one, you have enough glue, and number two, that you've got everything clamped together and there's no gaps. So check down each joint, make sure you don't have any gaps, and if you do, you may need to add a clamp to close those gaps up. Also, if you use this soft construction grade lumber, you'll need to use calls. You've got clamps that are applying horizontal pressure and pushing those pieces together, but with this soft wood it tends to bow as you apply more pressure so these calls keep everything flat as it dries. Before I get started sanding the top, I'm gonna to cut it to length with this circular saw guide. I did a video on how to make this. It's really easy. I'll put a link to that down below. I'm sanding the top with 60, 120, and 220 grit sandpaper, and I'm gonna mark the top before each grit so that I sand equally across the whole top.
I also used a router to round over the top and bottom edges. You don't have to use a router. You could use the random orbit sander or just sand it by hand. But the router is faster and it gives it a more uniform look and I personally think that looks better. If you've seen my video about the different types of drills and how to use them, I'll put a link to that down below in case you haven't. Then you've seen the overly dramatic bit I did poking fun at those who call drilling a hole pre-drilling. Pre being a preposition that means before, so somehow inception occurs and you're able to drill a hole before you drill the hole. Inception or is that more like tenant? Some Christopher Nolan movie, whatever. As captain of the grammar police, I like to point it out when somebody gets it right. This is called pre-stain wood conditioner. Now there's not stain in here that you would put on, say, pre-assembly. That would be current stain pre-assembly stain. This is a wood conditioner that you put on before you stain. Pre-stain, preceding your stain. Don't stain until you put this on. I have no connection or obligation to this company, but it's with a full heart that I'd like to say, well done, Minwax marketing team. All joking aside, anytime I stain soft wood or construction grade type lumber, I like to apply this wood conditioner. It seals the wood and once you apply the stain, it soaks in a lot more evenly and prevents blotchiness. So I'll apply this to both sides, let it dry for about an hour and then apply the stain. It's the end of the day, so I'll let this sit and dry overnight, and then tomorrow I'll spray the base and put an oil-based polyurethane over this. Before I paint the base, I'm gonna go ahead and drill the half circles for these figure eight fasteners. The idea of these fasteners is that the top is gonna to expand and contract across its width this way. If we attach it to the base permanently, it won't be able to move and expand and contract and that can cause cracking and checking. So instead we attach the top to these fasteners. Now we're gonna drill a half circle so that these will set down flush with the top of the apron here. And as the top expands and contracts, this fastener will swivel with the wood, allowing it to move. I'm gonna put three on each end, and then on the middle supports, I'm also gonna put three on each one of those. Now this gun I used is just a cheap little gun off of Amazon. I think with tax it's $40. It comes with a regulator on it. And the most important part, it's got a two and a half millimeter tip. So you can spray latex paint, even gel coat, primer. And I got it specifically for that. And this is polycrylic. I've got a little plastic handle I'm gonna spray it with. This is a little tip to make your projects look just a little bit more professional. Use a matte finish. See, I've got the clear matte here. Finishes that are too glossy really look plasticky and fake and cheap, but a matte finish really looks more like the professional furniture you would find at a high-end furniture store. I'm gonna put several coats of this on the bases. I'm not sure exactly how many yet, at least three or four. And then once I get to that point, I will sand lightly before the last coat. And then I still need to put an oil-based finish on the top over there.
Make sure you go get the free plan. The link is down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.